and thanks also to the staff and the AV crew for setting this up. I thought I'd start just with a vision of the, the, the present, actually. Sometimes you say vision of the future, but this is a construction project that's going on in China. It's modular build, so it's very tight time scheduling. Um, but what we can do using location, which is what I'm going to major on in the next 10 minutes or so, is use that location key as something to help us manage information for strategic project planning. So here you can see we've, in, we've brought in a BIM model using IFC. We've got weather sensors, we've got um, uh, particulate matter sensors, sulfur dioxide, nitrous dioxide. We can, keep sen we can keep track of all sorts of information using location as the common glue that, that, uh, that can stick it together. We can track um, mobile workers out in the field to see if they're working in confined spaces or close to other hazards. We can connect them with uh, lorries that are logistically traveling in and, you know, material uh, drop-offs. We can look at travel cameras, we can check on the scheduling, we can connect this to our project schedule. The general idea is that maps and location form the framework for all of this shared um, information and shared understanding. In this case, being able to track the actual delivery of components on site and we can adjust schedules if needed and so on. So I thought I'd start just with that because I'm a geographer, okay, and Esri is in the GIS business. So I will be just um, talking a little bit about that over the next 10 minutes. Um, but the challenges that we've all seen and faced and some of you will have experienced are, are these, you know, that it's, there are ongoing challenges which are being addressed in some places, but we obviously on the basis of these statistics, we know that we can do better. Um, and that is what is driving digital transformation and technology enabling the AEC sectors. And the reason for some of those delays and some of those statistics is that the information is moving from various stakeholders back and forth. And at every stage, it seems to me that there is information being lost. So that's what results in rework. That's what results in the lack of understanding of what the information means and how to use it. So this is costing time and money and effort and, you know, is part of the challenge. So the idea is to use technology as an enabler to help us to better manage information between those stakeholders, even between the phases of the, the project, and add value to it continuously. So we're not having to do rework, we're not having to find things, we're not having to go and resurvey because things just don't make sense. So I'm a great advocate for technology. Lots of the presenters here will be mentioning technologies that are designed to help with this information flow um, through the life cycle of a project. Um, and there's good reasons to do it, you know, as well as challenges, inevitably there's opportunities. Um, and who, as a project manager, would not want to achieve these outcomes? Who would not want to keep staff more safe on site? Who would not want to resolve issues faster? Um, now, for us, the thing that starts to crystallize is that any of these questions could be asked geographically or with a where question. So where are my staff? You know, so this is what we, we, we think we can add some value in, in GIS technology. And it's because of this, it's because location actually is critical to all of our understanding about the world around us, how we interact with the built environment and the natural environment. It gives us context, it shows us the interconnections, and it can demonstrate cause and effect. And I rely on this quote quite a lot from Gartner, um, that everything an organization does is in one way or another associated with a location. So I hope that you'd agree that in the context of a construction project, there's a lot of location involved. You know, it's difficult to ignore really when you start to think about it. And yet we don't see that being part of the framework for information management in all, you know, all, all the time. So we've, we've been working on this idea of location and location-based information and um, geographic analysis for 40 years or more. And we, we, we now term it the language of spatial analysis. So in the context of AC, it's answering the where question of project delivery. So we start with understanding where things are. Where are my sites? Where are my staff? Where are all my vehicles? Do we, do we know where people are on a daily basis? Have we got them in the right place? We can then measure things. We can measure shape, size, and distribution. Where, you know, how big are my sites? How big are my stockpiles? How do I know that I need to replenish that stockpile and when do I need to do it? We can determine relationships. So uh, is there a direct relationship between the performance of my asset 
and the local habitats or the local weather conditions. So what impacts my design? What impacts my delivery? We can determine best routes and locations for temporary buildings, egress, in, ingress, um, for access, for vehicles, for staff, for materials. We can detect and quantify patterns. So do I always need the same materials at the same sorts of sites? Am I over-ordering? And what can I learn from that? How does that impact my time? Why do some sites miraculously work better to time and budget than others? What actually is that? And what can I learn from looking at that spatially? And finally, modeling and predicting. So how can I manage and model risk on site? How do I con conduct rehearsals to make sure that in that previous example that the, um, the components are arriving on site, we're aware of local traffic conditions, we're aware of the consequence of delays, and we can readjust and reschedule. So how do we rehearse? How do we predict what might happen? So all of these things together are what we call the geographic approach. It's a way of thinking, it's a mindset, um, and some AECs are already using this approach to help them to deliver better projects. And again, I'd come back to it, it's, it's because location is so fundamental to the world around us. There'll be lots of talk about digital twins today, I'm sure. You've probably all got your bingo cards ready. Um, the location, I would argue, is one of the only attributes that enables us to better understand the interconnectedness, but also the complexity of the built environment, humanity and society, and the natural environment. If you think about just how we operate within those environments, there's very few things that you could point to that can help you to better understand what's going on. Um, and we manifest that in the technology as a geographic information system. So you've probably all heard the, I hope you've all heard the expression GIS. But it does enable us to overlay information from many different sources of many different types and reveal those patterns or answer questions um, and enables us to integrate systems together as well. If you like, it's becoming uh, the common framework for sharing information because of the location component. And in that sense, we're finding that AECs are now looking towards location delivered through the use of geographic information systems as a means of establishing a collaborative design environment. Because if you think about the BIM process of plan, design, build, operate, everybody's working on this in the same area. Everyone's, everyone is probably using a map at some point. And yet, the information isn't being associated to that map all the way through. So that's where we encounter information loss. So, and hence why you have you know, construction professionals on site wondering why on earth the foundations have you know, been laid the wrong way around. And in terms of um, providing standards and providing some guidance to, to the information management life cycle, ISO 19650 actually does require the use of a geographic referencing system. So there's, there's inbuilt within the standards, and there's a few speakers today that will talk uh, about adoptions of standards and frameworks and how do we better manage information. Um, and ISO 19650, at least, does say, well, actually, if you, you, you need to use a geographic referencing system because that helps the owner and your client at the end of it to understand where everything is. So it can start as early as site selection. And those of you that are urban planners will know that GIS has been used for a long time to choose the best site for your built infrastructure um, and site analysis. What do we need to know about the site and how that might affect our design? Environmental impact assessments. Well. Instead of that just being a point in time that gets put on a shelf, why not use that throughout the entire life cycle to come back to, to say, okay, how does the, environment, the local natural environment impact the way that we deliver this project? And then through to, to conceptual design. In the design phase, there's a need to test iteratively. There's a need to collaborate with other stakeholders. And again, using the map and, a, and, a, and web collaboration tools enables us to share things more easily and for them to be understood more quickly. And we call that designing with context. Why would you choose, as an architect or an urban planner, 
to design at zero, zero. My dad was an architect, okay, so I, I spent a lot of time sitting with him on a drawing board with a sh single sheet of paper. We never put a map underneath it. And I think back to it now and think, well, why didn't we do that? Why didn't we actually put a map underneath the first sheet of paper that we, that we took out? And that mindset, I think, has come through in, in the architecture profession, at least, to the reason why so many models that I'm sure you see are at zero, zero. Because it's, well, this is how we do architecture, this is how we do design. So some of the work that we're doing is with the um, BIM software companies to help enable the use of mapping right at the outset. So instead of having zero, zero, let's just start with where the, the infrastructure is going to be. Why would you not do that? I know it sounds obvious, but, and to be fair, it's taken us a while to figure out the technology in the background. But we're hoping that this will start to change the way that people think about the use of mapping throughout the project. And if we can achieve that, if we can get it at the start, then my belief is that it will then help to add value all the way around this circle. You know? And that is then making people more accountable and more responsible for the information that they manage and who's going to be using it next. Design validation in the field is another big topic. It's, it's not been that long. I mean, we've probably, we, you all use these to navigate, don't you? We, we, it's now commonplace to think of using a map on your mobile phone. Well, we're doing that in the field now. So now we can validate designs in the field, add additional information to pass back to the designers to say, well, you know, you might think that it's gonna work well in this way, but actually X, Y, Z. So by making that process more efficient and more collaborative, using mapping technology, we can in, in improve the iterative design process. When we get to construction, I showed the example at the beginning, it's, it's mostly around the logistics of delivering the construction uh, on site. And what we've also seen is use of drones and um, aerial imagery capture to monitor conditions on site. So remote survey, um, Balfour Beatty Vinci on the High Speed 2 uh, project have estimated they'll save around five million pounds using drone survey for stockpile management. So they can very rapidly in 20 minutes scan a stockpile, do the volumetrics on it, figure out how much is left, when does it need to be refilled. So this not only helps them with project planning, but it also reduces accidents on site because they haven't got field engineers going out 10 meters high with ranging poles anymore. Um, it's lowering their carbon footprint because there's fewer people actually doing that. Um, and it's increasing the speed that they can make decisions. Um, and ultimately, as I say, with, with the idea behind the digital handover, when we get to, to the delivery of the documentation to the client, a lot of road administrations, rail administrations, local authorities, they all use GIS to manage their assets. So if you can present them with your documentation geographically referenced, then what we found is that that makes it much easier for them to understand what, you know, what the situation is on the ground and also then better to start to operate and report and maintain that asset. So we like to think of, I mean, again, it's too easy for me to say as a geographer that you put the map in the middle, but I hope you'd agree that because everything that we're dealing with is in the real world, it sort of makes sense. Maps sort of make sense. And we'd certainly like to, to, to do more to try and help um, practitioners in all of these phases to manage information more efficiently and enable a smoother handover and less information loss as the information moves along. And you, I don't want you to just take my word for it. Um, th this is an independent report that we commissioned, that's been commissioned, and you know, even on small projects, design time saved of 22% construction time saved of 45%, project costs saved by 6%, just by using GIS and BIM, both as software and process, combining those two things together um, to enable different project delivery. So, with all of that said, I'm going to pass now to Helen Picard from Mott McDonald. We're gonna keep the tempo going. Um, just happy to share this very recent announcement yesterday. We've gone live for our next infrastructure conference here in Europe. Um, it's in Frankfurt, and the call for papers is open and registration is now open. So thank you for your time. Helen, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, sets me up quite nicely over what is GIS Geospatial. 
me to talk a bit about the geospatial BIM journey from my experience, what I've had, um, and how Dorothy could make a great BIM coordinator, or what we can learn from her. So, as we just said, I'm Helen Picard, I'm the Group GS leader um, with Mott McDonald. Uh, I've been there for 13 years now. Um, and I've been involved in many infrastructure and development projects, both in the UK um, and around the world as a GIS specialist, working with our environmental and, and engineering teams. In some of these projects, geospatial has been regarded as used for environmental disciplines only, um, but yeah, not then included within the central digital information management teams. Um, but at the same time, not actually kind of seen as an environmental discipline itself. So in, in these cases, I've felt somewhat like our Canadian colleagues here, um, a bit isolated. Uh, I can see the big picture of the landscape ahead of me, but it's quite tricky to communicate that to those on the ground. So um, I've also had experiences of where it actually is included within the information management team at the centre of the project. And I've seen how it can then lead into supporting that collaborative um, environment and behaviours between disciplines. Uh, it also helps interrogate the designs and provides an additional layer of uh, quality checking on those design models. So some of you may be familiar with this um, technology framework. Um, and you know, technology has come a long way in the last 20 years. It now enables the large-scale collaboration environment, um, and the collection and access to data that was never possible before uh, 20 years ago. So, and the processes have also evolved in that time, along with the tech. But we do need to be careful that we don't you know, overcomplicate things with that technology and get carried away with the array that's available. Um, and you know, we sh should ensure that that technology is assisting the people in their workflows and not making it more convoluted, or we risk them just you know, not buying in and going back to the old ways of working because they see it as more simple. So we need people who can communicate with these, uh, these processes and tell the story of how it will help the wider team. And this is where I want to focus a bit more of my talk is I see the sticky issues around people, the communication, um, and how we can work together, bring people together. And this is where yeah, I think bringing the BIM, the GIS side more closely aligned um, is always quite tricky. And I think getting us to work as one team um, and understanding each other better. So, this leads me into uh, parallels with The Wizard of Oz and what we might learn from Dorothy. So I compare the opening uh, of the film to the early geospatial journey. In Toto, Dorothy's dog, throughout the film we see he's quite a smart dog. Um, he guides some of the characters and provides some insights, like when he drew back the curtain to show that there's this guy, the wizard, just behind the curtain. He's just an ordinary guy. And some might say in similar ways, geospatial actually provides um, guidance, takes people to locations, and it provides insights to inform people. So therefore, Toto, Dorothy's dog, or from another view, uh, geospatial tools, is in trouble at the beginning of the film. Uh, he's been stirring up things with Miss Gulch's pace causing problems. Dorothy recognises the implications of this and what might happen, and she rushes back to the farm to ask for help from her aunt and uncle and the farmhands. Um, Dorothy tries to tell them of the problems that's going on and um, you know, what might happen, um, but they dismiss her. They're not really listening. And Miss Gulch takes Toto to the sheriff to have him destroyed for what he's been doing, biting her. Um, but Toto escapes back to Dorothy um, and together yeah. Geospatial fights back and she envisages a better place somewhere over the rainbow. And perhaps this better place is a BIM-enabled digital twin. So on this journey that they end up going down, um, 
in the, the land of Oz, Dorothy has to do some stakeholder engagement. And we could have a look at the munchkins here, also known as engineers and construction and maintenance workers. And they want to know, is Dorothy good or bad? Yeah, is she going to help them or hinder them along their way and in what they're trying to do? After all, she's vanquished the Wicked Witch of the East, also known as the old ways of working, perhaps paper data, uh, data collection methods. So she has to engage with them. And you know, she manages their expectations. She's humble and stating just the facts of how she managed to rid them of the Wicked Witch of the East um, and tells them you know, what she can actually do. Not to get carried away. And then Dorothy is told and given guidance to start from the very beginning and move along the yellow brick road. Uh, and you know, in some ways, you might um, associate strategies, the BIM execution model, as part of this guidance towards the Emerald City, also known as the BIM enabled digital twin. But along the way, she gets tempted by a shortcut across the property fields, um, which with her powerful scent sends her to sleep. But she's not alone. She's built a team along the way. And the bigger the goal that we have, the more we need people around us to help and support and, and take us down that journey. And they each provide support in different ways, different skills. And yeah, they wake her from this sleep in the property fields and take her back on track and down the, the guidance and strategy. Um, also, the Scarecrow provides um, you know, more, more assistance through his uh, ability to recognise she was hungry, she needed some food, but the best way to get the apples out of those trees was to annoy them so that they threw the apples at them in, in the first place and quench the hunger. Now, working together um, provided a, better, a greater purpose to their goal uh, as one team. So at journey's end, they realise ah, the, uh, it was in them all the time. They had what they needed themselves. Dorothy successfully inspired others to a joint endeavour and through the action and commitment that she um, demonstrated herself. Uh, she communicated with them about their wants and their needs and was not shy about communicating and expressing her own. She empowered them to achieve uh, their potential at the end. So what's my point here? <laughs> um, with this, you know, we're looking at, we need uh, a call to support the learning, the communication, and you know, joining together, like I was saying, having people who can actually talk and um, tell a story about this. Uh, bring teams together, translate terms, particularly over defining a common language between the BIM and the GIS, um, getting to understand what each other need to know and need to do to be effective. Understand our business needs, be that interface between the digital uh, delivery and those business outcomes that we need to achieve. We also need to inspire that next generation with the uh, industry outreach to schools, um, perhaps doing things like getting involved in the STEM network, GIS day activities, career days, getting on. And then um, we need to look at change management and invest in that change management process, ensuring that the digitally transformed processes help ease those workflows and help the people on the ground, and so ensuring the adoption of those processes. And that's... Thank you.